All right, back with another video refuting the damnable heresies of Dan Corner, or as I call him, Damned Corner, because he's teaching, he's he's a false teacher teaching damnable heresies, and his damnation slumbereth not, like it talks about in uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, I believe it is. So that's why I call him Damned Corner, because his damnation is just, and he's teaching, you know, damnable heresies from Rome, which is funny because he claims to be ex-Catholic, but you look at his doctrine, he's still teaching Catholic doctrine. So, you know, he may have left Catholicism, but Catholicism has not left him, clearly. So, uh, but on this article, uh, and, and the thing about his ministry too is that he's just obsessed, like he openly says that he's just basing his ministry off attacking internal security. He himself says that, quite frankly. Uh, he's obsessed with basically just teaching Roman Catholic doctrine. I'm, I'm going to show that just right now, actually. That denial of eternal security and also denial of imputed righteousness is in fact Jesuit doctrine. Uh, make sure I'm full screen. This is in the Council of Trent, uh, the sixth session on the Canons on Justification. At around uh, canon number, I believe it's 23, listen to what it says. If anyone saith that a man once justified can sin no more, nor lose grace, and that therefore he that falls and sins was never truly justified, or on the other hand, that he is able during his whole life to avoid all sins, even, whose, even those that are venial, except by a special privilege from God, as the church holds in regards to the blessed virgin, let him be anathema. So notice that. They're saying, if you're saying you cannot lose grace, let it be anathema. So yes, uh, denial, the conditional security is a Jesuit doctrine. You know, it's a Catholic doctrine. And on the thing of imputed righteousness, uh, the denial of that as well. Let me just go to the, uh, where is it? Uh, where is it? I'm trying to find a, let me just search it up. Uh, impute. Yeah, here it is. Uh, here it is, yeah. This is, uh, forgive me, I'm not good at these Roman numerals, so just bear with me. Let me just search this up real quick. Again, I'm doing this also on camera just to show that, you know, I'm still fallible. I still make mistakes. But, yeah, Roman numerals. I should have probably had this up beforehand, but just, this video was kind of on the spot. Yeah, this is uh, canon number 11. Look what it says about imputed righteousness. If anyone saith that men are justified either by the sole imputation of the justice of Christ or by sole remission of sins to the exclusion of the grace and the charity which is poured forth in the hearts by the Holy Ghost that is inherent in them, or even that the grace whereby we are justified is only the favor of God, let it be anathema. Notice how they're twisting it as well. They're making it seem like, oh, if you believe in imputation of, of the justice of Christ, somehow it's apart from grace or something. Weird. But again, we see how this denial of imputed righteousness is, you know, Jesuit doctrine. So here you have him, you know, and watch, watch, just watch the double speak of this guy as well. This is very, a very common thing you'll see with these, you know, former Catholics who are into the street preaching movement. Is these they use this Jesuit type of double speak. And like I said, as far as I'm concerned, Dan Corner is still a Catholic. You know, he may reject all the Mary idolatry. He may reject the heresies of infant baptism and the the pagan heresy of baptismal regeneration. But as far as salvation plans go, plan goes, he's still a Roman Catholic. You know, he's still a Catholic in his gospel, basically. Like I said, he may have left Catholicism, but Catholicism clearly has not left him. You know, it's just that simple. But he says here, uh, people in the Old Testament were not justified by the law as some think. Now watch the double speak. We're not justified by the law, but you know, watch this. We can be assured of this because no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by observing the law, Romans 3.20. But in, in my other video, he show, he flat out says you have to do good deeds to basically keep your salvation. You know, notice the double speak. Since this is true, how then were they saved? Surprisingly, they receive imputed righteousness just like we do today under the new covenant. Also notice the non-dispensational thing, you know. See, again, when you're non-dispensational, because under the Old Testament, I'm just going to come on and say it, you know, if, if this people don't like it, whatever. Under the Old Testament, they were not saved the same way New Testament saints are, hence why they went down to Abraham's bosom. You know, they didn't go up to heaven, because why? Well, they had to do the animal sacrifices. See, this is the thing that non-dispensationalists in particular don't really seem to address, is that if saints in the Old Testament were saved the same way New Testament Christians are, why did they even go down to Abraham's bosom? Why was there animal sacrifices being performed? You know? They can't answer that. Because if they were saved the same way we are today, they would go straight up to heaven. Because why? Well, if they're saved by the blood of Christ back then, they, they would no, there would be no need to go down to Abraham's bosom because they already had the perfect sacrifice on them. You know, If they're saved by looking forward to the cross, as they say. But the fact they went down to Abraham's bosom, because, again, those animal sacrifices, they were to, to uh, cover sins. You can read about that, by the way. And Because some people think, oh, they're just symbolic. No, they actually were needed to atone for sins. 
you know, they would cover your sins. You can read about that in Leviticus 4, Leviticus 5, Leviticus um, 16 talks about that. Uh, so many scriptures, okay, they, they were covering your sins, but they were not the perfect sacrifice. Hence, why they could not fully wash away your sins like the blood of Christ can. You know, that's what Hebrews 10.4 is talking about. It's not saying that the animal sacrifices could never had anything to do with the atonement. It's saying that they basically were not perfect and they could not amount to what, blood, what Christ's blood did. You know, they cannot wash away all your past, present, and future sins because the animals themselves were so corruptible as well as the high priest offering them. They were they themselves were also sinners. You read about that in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 1 to 5, and Hebrews chapter 7, verses 21 down to verse 28. And that also destroys the whole Roman Catholic Mass as well, by the way, which I did a video on that. But again, this is a bit of a side issue, but just showing the kind of mess you get yourself into when you're non-dispensational, when you refuse to rightly divide the word of truth, which is not surprising since he uses a lot of the modern you know, uh, papist versions of the Bible, the perversions basically, which actually take out, which take out rightly dividing from Second Timothy two fifteen. But anyway, I'm going. On. I could say a whole lot more on that, but uh, I'm not gonna. He says examples of such are Abraham, Genesis fifteen verse six. You know, whatever you know, goes about how they're how they had grace imputed to them. David also taught imputed righteousness in his era in the Old Testament. You know, and again, he, again, when you're not dispensational, he, again, he ignores that David was a typology of a New Testament Christian, but he was not, you know, he, he was not saved before the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay, nobody was saved in the Old Testament. When I say saved, I'm referring, I'm kind of using that like in jest because they they were not in hell, but they were not in heaven. They were in Abraham's bosom until the sacrifice of Christ happened. Then there was that resurrection of Old Testament saints. You can read in Matthew chapter 27, I believe it's verse 50 down to verse 53, if I'm not mistaken. Again, not in my notes, just kind of on the spot. In spite of this fact, we read in Ezekiel 33, verse 12 to 13. You know, again, goes back to the Old Testament to try to disprove eternal security. Here's the thing, too. Again, it goes back to the whole thing. Again, I'll keep saying this over and over again because he's an example of the mess you get yourself into when you're non-dispensational, the heresies you can get yourself into. Uh, anyone who goes back to the Old Testament, I'm just going to come out and say, anybody who goes back to the Old Testament to prove that you can lose your salvation today, they've already lost the argument. You know, they've already lost because that was, you know, Ezekiel 33, verse 12 to 13. That was uh, when there was Jews under the law. Okay, New Testament Christians are not Jews under the law. It's plain and simple. So he says, oh, we're not saved by observing the law, but then we're going to go back to verses that are under the law to say that you can lose your salvation today. You know, again, when you're non-dispensational, it's just a world of contradictions. But back to the full screen. And by the way, too, I'll just point it out as well. Non-dispensationalism is also Jesuit doctrine as well. You know, because you'll see Roman Catholics go back to verses about, you know, the, the uh, Davidic kingdom and apply it to the church today. You know, they'll go back to, uh, I think it's Isaiah 22. Again, I can say more on that, but non-dispensationalism is also a Jesuit doctrine. But he says, which if, again, again, further shows that, you know, he may have left Catholicism, but Catholicism hasn't left him. Anyway, I've gone off on a, on a far enough rabbit trail back to the main subject of the video, which is showing his false doctrine. Uh, he says, why then do people under the New Testament think that because imputed righteousness, our righteousness is our righteousness in Christ, uh, that they can afterwards turn to evil, the wrong plan of salvation, or, be, you know, basically what he's doing is he's straw manning. So what he does is that he, because uh, here you have, what you have I'll, I'll put it this way, okay? So what this is what the heretics don't understand, is that you have kind of a, I call it doctrinal false dichotomy, is on, on one side you have the, the hyper, like, antinomians, the easy believers like Jack Smack Seven Seven, who actually do believe that you can just live however you want and there's no, you know, repercussions, like like temporal repercussions, basically. Then you have the extreme other side, which is the hyper, you know, Pelagian work salvationist like this her like this heretic Dan Corner or guys like Jesse Morrell. Both sides are false. Okay, both sides are heretical and teach false gospels. Okay. Uh, Jack Smack 7 7, he believes you can't lose your salvation and believes in imputed righteousness, but he also thinks that that basically means you can just live however you want and that there's no consequences in this world okay you don't lose your salvation but he doesn't he also doesn't believe that there's any kind of like earthly temporal you know chasing from god basically and that essentially he like he actually does believe that grace means you can just live however you want and there's no repercussions and basically uh then you have the extreme other side which is the hyper pelagian work salvationists who think that that you do have to live holy but then it's actually for your salvation and also I'll also add that both sides, for example, you have the antinomian easy believers like Jack Smack 7 7, who will attack the post salvation changed life. Oh, and by the way, too, I'll just point that out. Uh, denial of the post salvation changed life is also a Jesuit doctrine as well, condemned in the Council of Trent, sixth session. You can look it up yourself. You know? So both sides are teaching Jesuit doctrine. See, all roads lead to Rome when you get down to it. 
But basically, they, they Jack Smack 7 7 will accuse you of work salvation when you're saying that after your salvation, you know, the Holy Ghost comes in and changes your life and cleans your life up and gets sin out of your life. He calls that work salvation. You know, and then the other side will also attack that and say, well, no, you actually have to do it for your salvation. See, both sides reject the post salvation change life. You know, because why? Both sides are, are extreme opposites of each other and both sides are heresy. It's a whole doctrinal false dichotomy. You know, just that plain and simple. The biblical stance is that you're not saved by what you do. You're saved by Christ and his imputed righteousness. Like his righteousness is given to you. It's God who provides you salvation. It's by grace through faith, you know, repentance towards God, faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And then after your salvation, the Holy Ghost comes in and you do good works, you know, after your salvation and because you're saved, not to be saved. Okay. And the Holy Ghost comes in and cleans your life up. But none of this is for your salvation, as, as these heretics on the, uh, and the Pelagian side would say, but this also isn't, you know, work salvation as the antinomian heretics would say, you know. But anyway, so he's using a whole strawman argument, which is very typical of these people, you know, these heretics. It's funny because both sides will use strawman arguments. See, the antinomians, they'll lump you in with the Pelagians if you say that, you know, that the Holy Ghost comes in and changes your life. Then these guys, they'll lump you in with the antinomians if you say that, you know, no, you know, you're not saved by your, by your self-righteousness. However, there is, you know, the changed life after salvation. It's just a whole doctrinal mess. But, you know, he talks about, you know, you can die spiritually because of sin. You know, Ezekiel 33, verse 18. Yeah, isn't that kind of why the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you of all sin? First John 1, 7. But, you know, when you're a self-righteous papist, uh, you don't really believe that, do you? Uh, and again, quotes uh, Hebrews 6, verse 4 to 6. Which is kind of funny, too, because all these heretics say that when you lose your salvation, you can get it back. But if you read Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4 to 6, it clearly says, you know, if, they're, if we're to go by their view, uh, it says otherwise. You know, it says it's impossible, you know, for if they had fallen away. Paraphrasing, of course, but it's funny how they think you can get it back. But, you know, if they were to read Hebrews 6, verse 4 to 6, it kind of says otherwise. If we're to go by their view of the verse, I mean, which uh, is an already an error. And again, I'm not going to read this whole thing because most of these scriptures have already been answered. Um, you know, he quotes Galatians chapter 5, verse 2 to 4, say you can fall from grace. Again, what's the context of the verse? Let's go read it. You know, uh, these heretics love just ripping these verses out of context to prove their doctrine. In fact, I'll just say this too. Never once have I ever, have I ever come across a um, conditional security heretic that has ever been like a deep student of scripture. Most of them will just just look for obscure verses and isolate them out of context. But then when you just read the immediate surrounding verses, it debunks their whole theology, you know. But it says, uh, basically, it just shows that they're not very deep students in Scripture, I'll put it that way. They're just basing their doctrine off of like, little tiny verses out of context. Like Galatians 5.4, it says, basically, and it's funny too, they, they home in on a thing, you're fallen from grace. But look at what the full verse says. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you're fallen from grace. Okay, what's, what's actually going on in this verse here? What does it mean when he says fallen from grace? He's saying that, basically, if you're trying to justify yourself by the law... Then you then basically Christ has become of no effect unto you, you know. And if that if that's the case, then you, you're no longer under grace. It's just that simple. See, they won't read that. They won't deal with the full context because it actually condemns them, because they're trying to justify themselves. You know, when it says Christ has become of no effect unto you, why is that? Why is that the case? Well, because you're trying to justify yourself by the law. If that's the case, you're no longer under grace. Because why? With John chapter one. John chapter one verse seventeen. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. If you're trying to go justify yourself by the law, you're not under grace anymore. It's just that plain and simple. But these heretics won't deal with that verse. You know, it talks about your faith can become shipwrecked. Again, with uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19 to 20, when you read it again in context, and you compare scripture with scripture, you know, when it talks about them being handed over to Satan, and also, too, when it talks about you know, the faith being shipwrecked, again, in context, it's saying that you can basically essentially make a mess out of your life. Uh, let's go to that verse. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. Paul's saying basically in context, you can make a mess out of your life and basically make your faith as if it was shipwrecked. Okay? And what talks about, you know, how I deliver it unto Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. Again, comparing scripture to scripture, which is what these heretics will not do. What does it mean to be delivered unto Satan? If you're in the context of a saved person. Because here's the thing too. If you've lost your salvation, you don't have to be delivered unto Satan because at that point, Satan already has you. You know, if you've lost your salvation, the moment you become lost, you're already a child of Satan. You don't have to be delivered unto him. You know, so what's going on in the text there? Well, when it talks about um, 
1 first Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5, to deliver such and one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So they won't read that verse. When you're being delivered unto Satan, it's basically physical chasing. It's, it's essentially it's a form of physical chasing from the Lord. You can see examples even back under the Old Testament where, like I think it's First Kings chapter 17 talks about, you know, how God could put a lying spirit in their mouth or how also, you know, let me just send you go to the other verse. Because it is true that it is a scriptural fact that God can actually send an evil spirit to afflict somebody if they're in sin as a form of chastening. First Samuel chapter 16, verse 14. And that's another thing too. These heretics have zero knowledge of the chastening of the Lord. They don't. They don't really seem to get that. Uh, where is it? First. Uh, here it is. So in verse fourteen, was it frozen now? Oh, verse fourteen talks about the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Then it talks about how an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Why? It, he was God was punishing him by sending an evil spirit to go and afflict him. Again, that's First Samuel chapter sixteen, verse fourteen and fifteen. You can go look it up. Okay. So anyway, back to the uh, back to his scripture twisting. So when it means you're being delivered unto Satan, it's for destruction of the flesh, but the spirit is saved. Because again, if you've lost your salvation, you don't have to be delivered to Satan. Because at that point, if you've lost your salvation, Satan already has you. The moment you've lost, you've supposedly lost it. So uh, again, more scripture twisting. Uh, he talks about you know if you do you no know, no immoral, impure, or greedy person will, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. You know, it's perverted modern Vatican versions. Just the reading is all messed up. You know, Galatians 6, 8. I, met, I, I uh, answered that in my other video, what it's talking about. It's not, in, again, in context, it's dealing with, um, basically, it, essentially, again, when you read it in context, it debunks your whole theology. Because it, when you read the thing in context, it's talking about uh, chastening as well as rewards. You know, they won't deal with it. You know, it talks about, uh, quotes a verse in Revelation 2, verse 10 to 11, which is, time of Jacob's trouble. Again, non-dispensational, you get yourself a whole, whole mess of false doctrine. Uh, and some may say, well, why aren't you reading the whole thing? Well, quite frankly, I don't have to because all these verses can be easily debunked. Uh, but the bottom line is, is that, like I said earlier, they have zero understanding of the chastening of God. Uh, here's a good scripture on that. Uh, first, first Corinthians chapter 11, verses 28 down to verse 32. Okay. This is a verse they won't touch for, for our two seconds because it actually not only proves chastening, it also shows eternal security as well. Uh, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. Okay? Now they'll say, well, see, you, see uh, you can, you know, be, you're losing your salvation, you're drinking damnation. Okay, again, let's actually keep reading and see what's going on there. Not, not just basing you know verses out of context and isolating them out of context and building doctrine off that, which is what these heretics do. So yeah, what does it mean to drink a damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body? For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you. Okay, among you, he's talking to saved people there. And many sleep. Uh, and notice that weak and sickly, you know, kind of like being afflicted, like we read in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 14 to 15. Uh, for if we were so, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Again, compare that back to First Corinthians chapter five, verse five. You know, Satan destroys your flesh, but your spirit is saved. You know, we're chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Okay, you're still saved. It's just your flesh is destroyed at that point. You know, but your your spirit is still saved. So again, these heretics have zero understanding of of God's chastening upon His children. Because why they're lost, quite frankly. They, these, these people don't have the Holy Spirit, so they can't understand God's word. It's just that simple. So anyway, don't be deceived by Dan Corner. Uh, he's a heretic. He's a false teacher. Uh, like I said, as far as I'm concerned, he's still a Roman Catholic. Still teaches all their false doctrines. Uh, so quite frankly, just mark and avoid him. He's a very dangerous false teacher. He's just obsessively going against the biblical gospel and teaching his, his Jesuitical self-righteousness, plain and simple. So anyway, uh, don't be deceived. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with all the brethren. Goodbye. Thank you.